as we sing uh, s- uh, the stanza 14, um, I've seen a wicked man whose ruthless power was firmly rooted like a native tree, and then soon no trace of him was left to see. It brings it into a new light when you think about how that happened with the um, Apostle Paul or Saul. Um, so often we sing these kind of uh, songs or hymns, and you think of God bringing judgment and oppression. Uh, but the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God takes wicked men and transform them, transforms them uh, through faith in Jesus Christ so that uh, those who were once murderers or sinners, adulterers, uh, are transformed by grace uh, through Jesus Christ so that you can't even notice. One day you won't be able to notice um, who these wicked men were. And yet so were all of we. And that is uh, the beauty also of uh, what we see in Acts uh, chapter 9. It reminds us, beloved brothers and sisters, that we shouldn't be surprised uh, by anyone who comes through the doors. Uh, You may know uh, certain people in your life, either from family or from school or college or your neighborhood or just by being out and about uh, that you think, I'd never see that person in church. And then they walk into church one day and your first reaction is, what are you doing here? Like, why would you be here? The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is for everyone, and he calls people from every background, every race, every ethnicity, every socio-demographic status. He calls all people. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so when uh, the church of Jesus Christ does mission, we encounter the unexpected. We uh, see people coming through the door that you never dreamed of. And it challenges the way that we view the church of Jesus Christ, where formerly people think, well, those who will stay are those that look a certain way and act a certain way and come from a certain background. You begin to realize when the church does mission, that's not the way Jesus works. Maybe a social club works that way but not the church of Jesus Christ. And so in Acts chapter 9, we encounter, the church of Jesus Christ encounters the unlikeliest of brothers. And the church of Jesus Christ experiences the most unlikeliest of preachers. Those who many people thought, there's no way this man will ever be a friend He's a foe. He's an enemy. There's no way this man can ever be part of this family because he's trying to destroy every one of us. There's no way that this man would ever preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because he's doing everything to destroy those who do. But he is. Saul is the unlikeliest of brothers and preachers. That's our theme. We're going to look first just at uh, Saul's persecution, so kind of where he came from. Before we do that, um, there's two names that um, Saul goes by, Saul and Paul. Um, For some reason, in uh, Christian circles, there's this perception that Saul was pre-conversion and then Jesus changed his name to Paul. That's actually not true. Um, This is just uh, the same name. A Hebrew name is Saul. His Greco-Roman name is Paul. Uh, So some of you immigrants may be familiar with having an Asian name and an English name. Well, in this case, Saul is his Hebrew name, and Paul is his Greco-Roman name. And so that's why most of us will know him as the Apostle Paul. Why? Because often the letters are written to Gentiles in a Greco-Roman context. So that's the name he commonly uses. Uh, but here, he's in Jerusalem. He's still among Jews. And so Saul is the, uh, the name that's uh, predominantly used. He was born in Tarsus. And so the reason he has these two different names is he's born in Tarsus of a Jewish family, but Tarsus is modern-day Turkey. And so there's a Jewish community, but very much in a Greco-Roman environment. Seems like he was quite uh, uh, wealthy. Um, His family could trace their ancestry back to uh, the tribe of Benjamin, which gained status in ancient Israel. He was circumcised according to the law on the eighth day, uh, meeting the exact requirements of um, what... Uh, a a child of Israel, a son of Israel should have. Um, And then he had the benefit of going to some of the best teachers um, of his day. So his teacher was Gamaliel. 
um, a very famous Gamaliel. And so he was very much zealous for maintaining uh, the Jewish identity as has been passed down uh, through history and tradition. And to maintain that, he recognizes uh, there is a threat, and that threat is this person of Jesus Christ, whom more and more Jews are beginning to follow saying that our life is not um, found by trying to keep the law perfectly. In fact, we can't do that. Our life is found by believing and following the person of Jesus Christ. And so Saul, he's on this deeply misguided holy war to persecute Christians. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3, it says that he's ravaging the church, entering house after house, banging on the doors, opening the doors, are you a Christian, putting them in chains, taking them for trial, seeing them stoned, dragging off men and women, not just leaders in the church, but any follower of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 9, it says he's still doing that, and he's been so good at it that he's persecuted the church in Jerusalem, and then he goes to the high priest, and he says, you know what? I've heard that there's a large Christian community in Damascus. Can you please give me a letter so I can go to the synagogues, and I can tell the people in the synagogue I have authority to continue my mission here in Damascus? And you can imagine the pe- Christians in Damascus. It's clear from Acts 9. They hear that Saul's coming their way. They hear that he's coming with a mandate, maybe even a list of names. So-and-so is a Christian. So-and-so is a Christian. Go ahead and hunt them down. Put them in chains. Persecuting the followers of the way. Now that phrase, followers of the way, is an early way of referring to Christians. They were the ones who believed, uh, not in the old way of following the law, but believed that Jesus is the way of redemption and restoration. That life is found not by following a list of rules, uh, but by giving yourself to the person of Jesus Christ and being changed and shaped by him. It's hard for many of us to imagine what this kind of persecution would be like. Some of you have experienced it, but many of us just hear about it. There are places in the world where this is the norm. In North Korea, if you're found out to be a Christian, you're immediately taken, sent to a labor camp for life, hard labor where few people survive, or you may even be killed on the spot. You can just imagine on your front door the in Somalia, Christian converts that are converted from the Muslim religion, they're high value targets of Al Shabaab. Their whole one of their missions, a militant group, is to desire eradicate Christians from the country. In China, months um, It seems like every month there's a report of another religious uh, denomination or church group that have been uh, rounded up. Recently I heard of another one from Reform Connections where all the elders and pastors were taken. So just imagine for a moment if we heard that Trudeau and Kim Jong-un had agreed that Kim Jong-un could send somebody over here to find all the Christians and take them back to North Korea. wouldn't be hard to figure out who was the elders, the pastors, who were the Christians of this church. Saul's a persecutor, killing friends and family and even Christians themselves. And then this text forces us to wrestle with this dynamic because his actions are clearly wicked and destructive, not just from a distance, but very personally. 
There may very well be people in Damascus who had family that were killed by Saul. How do we wrestle with that? Well, throughout the New Testament, and we see this in the book of Acts several times, persecution is terrible, it's painful, it can be filled with suffering, but God's word reminds us that we need not fear, but also that we should remember who we once were. There is a sense where you and I have to be able to see ourselves, who we once were outside of Jesus Christ, in those who are in rebellion to God. It should cause us to have a certain level of humility as we see persecutors and helps us to understand why Jesus Christ says, pray for those who persecute you. Why? Because if you know the grace of God, if you know why you need Jesus Christ, then you know you yourself was a sinner, a worst of sinner. And so in that light, we don't have to fear the worst of sinners because our God is greater. There's incredible wisdom in uh, Acts chapter 5 where Paul's teacher Gamaliel talks to the Sanhedrin. This is early on in the Christian church and the Sanhedrin's trying to understand this is a Jewish uh, leadership community. They're trying to figure out what do we do with these Christians. Some of them want to go Saul's route of persecuting them. Some of them uh, want to just let things be. And Gamaliel says, listen, Here's my advice. Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. What's Gamaliel's wisdom? He's saying if God is in it, no matter how strong or how powerful you think you can persecute this group, if God is in it, you won't be able to conquer them. You won't be able to overthrow them. You won't be able to eradicate them. In fact, what you will find is you will find yourself opposing the living, almighty God. And Saul did not learn this lesson from his um, teacher Gamaliel, but instead found himself persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. The church of whom Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so Saul, he's traveling to Damascus. As we come to Saul's conversion, the second point, he's traveling on to Damascus. He has the letter. He's traveling with a group of men. He's excited about um, finding Christians, persecuting them, uh, imprisoning them, um, bringing them back to Jerusalem. And as he's uh, traveling there, there's a light from heaven. Um, we're told in Acts 26... There's two other places Paul talks about this conversion story. And there's a light from heaven that's brighter than the sun. It shines around him. And Saul, he falls to the ground and he hears this voice speaking. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, he likely knew of the Old Testament stories of theophanies. Theophany is where God appears in brilliance and in splendor. And so Saul responds. He says, who are you, Lord? Trying to understand, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you then? And the response is, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, Saul in this episode is not having some kind of psychological um, vision we know that because the other men that are with him, uh, they're traveling with him, they stand speechless, they hear a voice, they don't see anything. So there's something very real happening. And that what is happening that is real is the Jesus Christ who was born in Bethlehem, who lived the perfect life, who um, did wonderful miracles, uh, preached the wisdom of God and the way to God, who died on the cross for our sins, rose on the third day, ascended into heaven. The Jesus Christ, the very Jesus, same Jesus Christ that we encounter in the Gospels now encounters Saul. 
Jesus appears to Saul in glory. And he speaks to him in the Hebrew language. We're told that in Acts 26. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now in Saul's mind, Jesus was dead and buried. In Saul's mind, he was persecuting some confused Jews that were following this person, Jesus. But notice what Jesus Christ says. You may think you're persecuting my disciples. You may think you're persecuting the church, but you are actually persecuting me. The Bible teaches that the church of Jesus Christ is the body and Jesus is the head. The Bible teaches that there's such a close identification with the believers and their Lord through the power of the Spirit that believers are in Jesus Christ, that they are the body of Christ. This is important because if you persecute the church, you're not just persecuting people on earth. You are persecuting Jesus Christ. You are reenacting the crucifixion in your actions. This should also cause each one of us to be careful when we think about or speak about the church. Jesus died for you and I. Jesus died for the people sitting next to you. Jesus died because he thought you were precious. Don't tear down one another. Don't gossip against each other. Don't seek to destroy one another. Treat each other as the body of Jesus Christ. Love one another as you love Jesus Christ. So Saul is forced to face that reality. He's not just persecuting random people who are confused. He is persecuting uh, the living Jesus Christ who is present in his people through the power of the Spirit. And so Jesus tells him, this is what you're going to do. Rise, enter the city, go into Damascus, the city you were planning to go to, and you'll be told what to do. And so Saul, in Acts uh, chapter uh, 9, it says he rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing, he was blind. And so the men with him, they lead him into Damascus, and for three days he's without sight. So he's blind, and he's fasting. He's neither eating nor drinking. This is often in his scripture, it's very symbolic of uh, a period of religious dedication or devotion. Ananias is told, you're going to find a man praying. So for three days, three days, no interaction, blind and praying. We're not told what he was thinking, what he was fe- feeling. Perhaps it's left to our imagination or even more importantly, it's probably not important to us to imagine that. What's more important is what comes next. But before we see how Ananias comes to him, recognize that Jesus Christ is here at work. He has a plan. He obeyed his Father's will in going to the cross. And then through his death on the cross and his resurrection and ascension, he now takes that finished work of paying for sins and begins to apply it throughout the world, in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and in Judea, and now going into Damascus, into the heart of Paul and Saul, and then from there going into the world. Why? Because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died so that people would be saved. Whether they think they needed saved or not, Jesus Christ accomplishes his salvation purpose. Saul, he recognizes this later when he writes in Galatians 1 verse 15. But when he, Jesus, who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. When God, who revealed his son to me in order that I might preach among the Gentiles, 
In other words, Saul recognizes that what this, this episode on the Damascus Rose wasn't just some serendipitous encounter that Jesus just happened to be there. No, it was God's sovereignty at work, working out his plan from beginning of creation, from even before when Saul was born. Why? So that in the story of Saul, we might see that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So that we might see the incredible perfect patience of Jesus Christ to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So that you and I might also recognize that there is no one so far, no one so distant from the saving grace of Jesus Christ that God cannot change them into an, in an instant according to his purpose. Some of you may come and be here week after week and think, well, I could never really come to faith in Jesus Christ. I love being here, but... I can't see that ever happening in my life. And it's true. From a human perspective, in your own strength, you cannot. But do not avoid or ignore this truth. Christ can do a good work in your heart. So don't think about what you think is possible in your life. Pray to Christ. Pray to Jesus Christ. And then we shouldn't be surprised at who comes through the door. Rather, prayerfully anticipate what God will do. Whether rich or poor, whether famous in our community or people uh, that have been rejected by our community. If God will have you, he will have you. And how he does so in this passage is wonderful. Wonderful. Jesus comes to one of his disciples, Ananias, who lived in Damascus. Ananias knew why Saul had come. He knew that Saul was there to find people like him, to chain him and to kill him. And then the Lord Jesus approaches Ananias and says, Go. Go to the street called Straight. Maybe there's a play on words there with way and straight. It's not made explicit in our passage and we won't spend much time on that. Rather, Jesus tells Ananias, go. Go to the man called Saul. He's a chosen instrument of mine. This man whom you have feared because he was coming, now you will minister to because he's going to be used by me. And so Ananias responds by going. He departs and enters the house. And you can imagine Saul fasting, praying, uncertain as to what's going to happen next, knowing that Jesus Christ had appeared to him. But I think many of us have had this experience where you commit some grievous sin that hurts the community or or fractures the community. And the last thing you want to do after that is to show your face. And yet Ananias, he goes to Saul and he lays his hand on him. And then I love these words. Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Formerly you were an enemy, but today you're more than a friend. Today you're a brother. You've been saved by Jesus Christ. You've been adopted by our Heavenly Father. And you're now included in the family of God. You are a brother to me. You who killed friends and family, who killed disciples of Jesus Christ, you're a brother. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Saul, he shares it like this in Ephesians 2. 
We were, I was, people who live in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, by nature children of wrath, not deserving to have a home with God or to be part of his family, not deserving God's love and wrath, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. With those words, Ananias makes clear that in Jesus Christ, there's room in the family of God for the worst of sinners. Forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Forgive one another even when that one another was your persecutor. Because you once lived in rebellion against Jesus Christ. your worst enemy. By grace through faith in Jesus Christ, may one day be your brother or your sister. The man who robbed you, God's grace can turn him into a friend. The despot who persecuted you can one day be your preacher. And you might sit there and think, I will never accept any kind of relationship or love or advice or guidance from that person because I know who that person was. But Jesus Christ says to you, you may know who people were, but wait till you see who I make people to be. And so if anyone is in Christ, If anyone confesses faith in Jesus Christ, if anyone belongs to the church of Jesus Christ, they are a new creation, and that's how we're to see them, to treat them as that new creation. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared, who appeared to you on the road, also came to me, and he told me to come to you so that you can regain your sight and be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because it's through the Holy Spirit that Jesus works powerfully in this world. And so he fills his believers with the Holy Spirit, commissioning them uh, so that they can become instruments in his hands. And so Saul receives his sight. He's baptized into uh, the church of Jesus Christ and is strengthened after taking food. And then you see immediately following his commission, you see this deployment that happens. What does he begin to do? Instead of persecuting the Jews or persecuting the Christians, he goes and preaches to the Jews in order that they may come to know Jesus Christ. You see that, we won't spend a lot of time in this final point, uh, but you see that in verse 20 through 22, and he focuses there in this Jewish community very specifically on two major points. He emphasizes that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, that Jesus Christ is uh, the Son of God who came from heaven to earth. That God himself sent his Son to be the Savior and then proves that he is the Messiah. This Messiah would have been a well-known Jewish uh, term uh, in the Old Testament, the anointed one. This is the one they've been waiting for for so long. They've been looking for him. And uh, Paul says, look, uh, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And not only is he the Messiah, he is the Son of God. God has made clear the way. And I, who once formerly persecuted those who are following this way, now proclaim to you that Jesus is the only way. That there is uh, salvation to be found in no one else. That there is no other name under heaven by which people can be saved except in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent and confess sin and in the cross of Christ find forgiveness and life in his name. And so that's the beginning of Saul's ministry in Damascus, first to the Jews. And then very soon, um, as the book of Acts shows, he begins to go and preach this gospel out into the Gentile community. It's a powerful testimony of Jesus' work. 
in the early church, in the book of Acts, how he takes a persecutor and makes that person into a brother and a preacher. There's a little bit of tension and, and the things to work through as he goes back to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples say, oh, no, we're not convinced. And then it takes uh, Barnabas to go to uh, them and say, no, this is actually what happened. He came uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. He's been living a changed life. He's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may not think he can be a brother or a preacher. He is certainly one of the most unlikeliest brothers of preachers, but he is a brother in Christ and a preacher. Beloved of Jesus Christ, be humbled that God works the same way with you. It's easy for us to paint Saul in such, into such a wicked picture that we cannot recognize that we ourselves have fallen short of the glory of God. No, be humbled that Jesus Christ works so with you and with us all. Be humbled, but also be excited and encouraged. So often we look at mission, we look at the world, we look at other people through this human perspective. We may even use this language where, well, humanly speaking, I just don't see it happening. Well, don't humanly speak. You've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You've been given eyes of faith, so speak with the words of faith. Because that's the truth that Christ has revealed. And so be encouraged, be humble that Christ works, Jesus works so with you. Be encouraged that he does so and be excited to see how he does so yet once more in different ways and in different places. He dies for the worst of sinners so that they may have life and reconciliation, peace with God and one another. Let's pray for that. Let's proclaim Jesus in the name of Jesus powerfully to that end. Amen.